to be supported in so many ways. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna talk a bit about I guess about my life and and being in the building trades and how that informed the show. And then some of the first basic parameters of how the show came about, and then basically just open it up to questions. Um, I don't have a, a long rambling, though I probably will. <laughs> uh, especially in the beginning. Um, so, I guess one thing of note is I started, I started building in my mid-20s. Um, I'm not from a family of builders, I'm from a family of mostly teachers and, and uh, healthcare workers. Um, so this is, I didn't really grow up around building materials. Um, I didn't grow up around the tools necessary to work with wood. Um, <clears throat> but there's just something about it that uh, after I got my bachelor's, I was just like, you know what, I want to make a house. I just want to know how to build a house. <laughs> um, so with all, all the student loan debt that came about, um, I started working nine bucks an hour just as like the gopher uh, on, a, on a crew in Portland, Oregon actually. And I think, I guess I just want to give a shout out to all of the contractors that I worked with. Um, I call. I feel really lucky that somehow I always, um, I always find myself on a crew. I call them NPR crews. Um, you know, it's like more likely to have NPR on than yeah. classic rock or whatever. You know, it's just really communicative and mindful builders that were willing to willing to take the time um, and actually help me learn some of the trades. Um, I guess art artistically, um, I've just been uh, bouncing about among materials. I've always been like, I guess I was always that kid that could draw, which there seems to be a conception that if you can draw or paint, you're an artist. And I th that's pretty pervasive, I think, especially for young people um, and I guess general population that hasn't been hasn't had the fortune of, of seeing like some of the creative output of amazing people. Um, <laughs> I need a dry mouth is gonna happen. So got my trusted Modelo. <laughs> and uh, so many of you probably know, but some of you may not. Uh, for years I was just into upcycling like found metal making mostly wall sculptures with those, a um, few chandeliers. Uh, that sort of ran its course and I was at that spot where I didn't feel like I was engaging in anything conceptually interesting. Um, it just seemed like a, like a one note song of like, oh, salvaging old things, making something that looks pretty and shiny, but there wasn't, you know, it was like one concept over and over. So I tired on that a bit. Um, I've dabbled in concrete. You might know the sculpture across the river. It's called Moonpool. Feel free to visit anytime. Um, and then, and then I guess this show really came about by just thinking of all of these trees that were like coming through my life, and. Um, and also thinking about the fact that like the most basic building materials, I do want to say I've said many of these things before, so many of you have probably heard it, um, but I'm sure not all of you. Uh, so, so just the idea that these basic, most fundamental construction materials, um, especially construction grade lumber and this is basically the cheapest sheathing other than OSB um, which I wouldn't recommend using for anything OSB and, um, and so in a real way 
these materials are are the the nests. They're the they're the structures that we inhabit, and they're so ubiquitous that they almost become invisible. Um, and so I think I think you probably agree that there's something interesting in that. That it is it is our homes. Um, it's our it's our dwelling place, but because it's everywhere, we just never appreciate it. Um, and we also forget that it came from the forest. Like <laughs> that that wild green that you can see out there, like turns into this, and then we live in it. Um, <laughs> it's wild. So so just a quick parameter on how the show came about. about um, Originally, the first parameter that I handed myself, um, being someone that if if I don't have um, if I don't have a focus, I will just generally be all over the place. Just being a generalist in general, um, <laughs> and so the first parameter was I'm going to see if I can make an interesting show using just eight foot two by fours kind of like the most rote, simple, like basic building. Um, and I do, I do remember at least two almost full days of just, of just being in my shop in my basement, holding two by fours, <coughs> sliding down two by fours, Wondering if this parameter was impossible. Um, had a few ideas, um, and once once a couple of those were actualized, realizing that I made the parameter and it was beneficial and appropriate to expand it. And I was like, wait, this it's this is about building materials. Um, so yeah, that's that's really how it started, and then. Uh, I guess just allowing myself to uh, to find flexibility and um, whatever that whatever that magic to me that magic um, result of spending time with anything that you're interested in. Sometimes the best thing to do is to just uh, to just go get a cup of coffee or. Or just stare at it. Has anyone read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? Familiar? Yeah, uh, per se describes this really well. It's like when you are stuck, if you have enough information that has gone in, your brain, your mind will work on it when you are not attentive to that. Um, so yeah, it's about it's about taking time to to experience, to like take in, and then allowing mine to start seeing if there's anything interesting in there. Uh, yeah, what else? I guess I want to just open it up for questions and, and chat a bit. Talk yeah. about the tools. The tools. Talk about the tools. <laughs> Can you add a little more? <laughs> I like them. <laughs> well, the curve on those two pieces is extremely fine. And I'm thinking about my saws. And I have hand saws that are that thin, but not electric. So, And the work over here with the reciprocal sander, mm -hmm. or the orbital sander, and that's really, uh, that's very imaginative. And I just, I had to fight myself to keep from touching it. Because I know exactly what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> and you really want to, I mean, wood is a tactile thing. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it's sensuous. I have noticed that uh, this show inspires people to touch, <laughs> which is fine with me, but it's just wood. generally speaking, everyone, <laughs> not cool everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, it says that's the only one you're allowed to touch. Over there. It says the only like, one. Oops! I read that sign. Well. I've actually seen people do that. <laughs> yeah. Specifically, like, after being like, oh, oh, and then you see that one, you're like, oh. 
So yeah, about the tools. Um, I don't really know what to say about the tools. Chisels? Is everyone is How everyone familiar? How did you do it? You do it? Well, let's Can talk really? about a couple pieces specifically. So this is called curving. Um, basically, the void that is created by any blade is called the curve. Um, and then, if you verb that term, curving is the act of uh, putting putting many cuts, and that's what the tracks are. So I can set the depth and lay the track, and just you know, all night put all the lines in. Um, the first one was almost like a monster because <laughs> I didn't plan it out. So I was in my basement, um, like without straps or anything, and like wrestling it and. Uh, I thought that I was probably going to have to soak it, soak it to get the veneer to, to curve the way it is. Um, the later iterations, I realized that if I went down even just like barely a sixteenth of an inch, all of a sudden I could form it without the wrestling match. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's just a, it's a technique that's used uh, often when you're putting veneers on a curved table. Mm -hmm. Um, any curved wall. I've done it with sheetrock and or plywood, just like in the building trades. So yeah. And I guess one tool I want to mention is I did, I did happen to find like an old mallet, an old wooden mallet. Um, and it's one of those, it's one of those tools that just feels so right in your hand. <laughs> and it was all, it was, it had epoxy and paint all over it. So I was able to sand that and uh, soak it with boiled linseed. And it's one of those tools that just wants to be in my hand. So most of the, the three plywood pieces, that's almost all uh, just like tapping, just tapping with a chisel. And the motivation being, I, I really wanted to use this basic sheathing just because it is, like I said, it's so ubiquitous in the trades. Mm -hmm. And generally, like the the shear force and the filling in between the, the studs in the walls of the houses that we live in, modern houses. Um, and so the motivation was really just let's let's go in and find out if there's anything interesting in here. And I guess I would. I guess I would say that in my life, and I think it's pretty general, um, that like I guess the level of interest is it's almost a direct relationship with one's ability to approach, to spend time, and to have interest, like our ability to look. Um, yeah. So, yeah, cheers to the mallet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were, we're building the house, Susan and I have mm -hmm. built a house before. And many times when you're ripping a piece of plywood or drilling through it with a hole saw or whatever, you expose a small portion of what you, you have exposed here. And I think it's amazing that. You know, when you strip away one level of plywood, the veneer on the outside, they want to look nice, and you find that below it, there's so much depth, so much artistry, so much nature, and it's pretty amazing. And it makes me feel bad about all the you know, pieces of plywood I throw away. <laughs> yeah, and that's, I mean, that being part of our experience just as uh, consumers, yeah, we yeah. need homes. We need food. Um, Thank you for closing it. Yeah, it's my yeah, pleasure. There's a, there's a real intimacy, I think, in what happens for me of what you're exposing. It's almost like you're seeing something. Yeah, cool. Thanks. <laughs> I like done this when you said it. I wanted to see if there was anything there. There was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like a time lapse. Yeah. Exactly. Like you're seeing it's into really the time cool. of it. 
Yeah, yeah there, there does tend to be, whenever there's a piece of lumber that has knots and you start slicing it like that, there tends to be a thing that to me suggests kind of moon phases and, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and time. Time shows up in the phases of the, of the branches and knots. That was one of the first, um, I learned that recently, but that, uh, that, I don't know if you even call it a technique, uh, that activity of just taking a board and running through a bandsaw just to slice it up and lay it out, that was one of my first engagements with what these materials are. That was in the, I'm just going to do eight foot two by fours phase. Um, and I realized there was some fertile ground there to keep on digging into. That analogy didn't quite make sense. Mm -hmm. he, in a lot of these, I noticed um, kind of diving in so much that you're you're observing salt through it. Um, a lot of the, through the material using the wood as a mirror of salt. Can mm -hmm. you give riffs off that? Observing self. Um, are these yeah, the human these are self portraits? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Including the human in it. That one. Yeah. I just realized I forgot to talk about a whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, so another another. I think that this will around the way get into that. Another foundational aspect of what's in this room is, is engaging, just because it is with the materials of the building trades, it's engaging like how we spend time and really getting, in, getting into uh, labor and the value and often undervalued nature of that. Um, so this is a, these two are from that form. Um, and I traced, I traced myself not intentionally as a, as a self-portrait. It was just the most available homo sapien shape that I had. <laughs> um, and, yeah, should have been Christine. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, and so, self personally, my intent was more to be um, perhaps like species or cultural based rather than like personally based. Just sort of the shape, the shape of a Homo sapien um, engaging these materials that that house and sustain and uh, protect us. Um, and then also, just by way of these being the materials of the trades, having that so often show up with people, um, with people just engaging the abstraction, the abstract overlay, if you will, uh, of trading a thing that we call time for a thing that we call money, and they're both quite abstract ideas. So to to trade hours for a wage, um, hopefully, is a thread that goes all through this. And then personally, like that's what I have done for most of my life, like trading trading hours for a wage. Um, and I guess my artistic ventures are in some ways obscured, but it still kind of comes down to spending time to, to create a thing that could be sold and or enjoyed. So yeah, these are, these are my uh, shop thoughts, for sure. <laughs> and I'm like, what am I even doing? Does that uh, kind of value assessment play into you? I, I think about this piece all the time as it's kind of like the sneaky giant in the room of the value of self and, and, and holes. Yeah, cool. Um, 
Yeah, that one. Just to talk about that one a little bit, it's obviously the most personal. If anyone hasn't read the, the little blurb by it, um, please do before you go. <clears throat> yeah, just that concept of, um, of possible perfection uh, and the idea of improving the world. And that's not just a personal improvement, though that is a representation of like some of my own struggles. But even, it, that goes back to the forest also. You know, like we, we are harvesting trees and we're making them useful. Uh, many people might think of that as an improvement. Financially, they don't, trees don't really show up until they become a commodity, right? Uh, and then, so it just, <clears throat> it just ties into like what we value and, and how we spend our time, yeah? And how we engage, not to overstate, engage this magnificent, wonderful world and our place in it, which is, a, it's kind of a conundrum every day. Yeah. Ben? Yeah. Sorry, you know, yeah, the knots are the best part of these words, you know. <laughs> like, yeah. What I hear sometimes as people where we're trying to maybe eliminate some of the best parts of who we are. Yeah. You know, conformers. You got it. You got it. And there's we just have all these holes we've children ourselves. If we if we fully deleted all of our flaws, we would I suggest uh, philosophically, that we would become not useful. Like those boards have no integrity. They have no structural integrity. Um, and that language is interesting when applied to humans and ourselves and our flaws. Yeah. Yeah, it's not interesting. <laughs> 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 Are you talking about AI? No. <laughs> Anything. Let's go. <laughs> Is this one of the ones you stared at? Uh, that idea came about the two by four. I think was the first one. Yeah. Um, and that did come about. It was it was so therapeutic for me. It was one winter. People that are close to me know that I I get sad in winter, and uh, that was one of those where I was just like went into it and I was like I love this idea and you know it was a it was a way to um, it was a way to externalize and then like it helped me think it through by way of externalizing yeah so how I mean those are boreholes are are they not yeah it's just a, it's spade bits it's drill bits depending on the size of the flaw there's mm -hmm. there's so you were holes. drilling out or not knots and just boring them out? With yeah, the idea of being just on the surface, anything that uh, could be called a flaw in the river, right. like it's not perfectly clear. Sure. Any knot, any like, yeah, I was just like, that's got to go. Just any flaw is going to be completely removed mm -hmm. and we'll see what's there. Cool. Yeah, and I tried to take them all the way to, most of those are kind of center of tree boards. I tried to take them all the way to the core and like completely remove the flaw, yeah, which completely I mean, ruins the lumber. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't have known they were. That's what the purpose was, in, you know, unless you described it. But now, that's you can see that as a lot of work, certainly. Yeah, and it almost becomes a. Um, just to point out, that becomes almost like a. A void version of the one in front with the hanging down two by fours. Right. Yeah. yeah. What's your work process on that? I mean, <clears throat> so that one, um, the work process was slow. <laughs> it's a. Uh, Can you like identify branches? Yeah. And found a way to get them out. Yeah. So it's a. It's, in, in building houses, 
pretty much any 2x4 that has the center of the tree, meaning if you look at the end of it, you'll see a bullseye rather than just green. Um, they are historically pretty poor for building, just because if there's any curve in the tree, uh, they will take that on. Um, they just have like forces coming from all directions of the center. And the center often gets kind of punky. You know, they're just not, it's not good lumber. <clears throat> so in the trades I've had it that like, sometimes you can, you can work with a, with a bow or a twist, but if it's center of board, it's kind of like that one, there's not much hope for it. Um, so just having that, um, having that as some of the history of hanging out with two by fours. Uh, and then that's, that is quite inspired by Giuseppe Pannone. I, I don't know if I'm saying his name correctly. I'm embarrassed about that. Um, he, did, he did some massive, massive pieces where he was taking, uh, he was taking old growth. I think he did a redwood, just the, the biggest trees that barely exist on the planet anymore. He dug in and he, uh, he was able to first like chainsaw, huge chisel, um, and then actually would come to a growth range that he wanted to follow. So he would leave the, I'll try and pull up some pictures after the talk, but he would leave the base and the top of this massive trunk and then reveal the sapling in the middle with like two sides uncarved. And when I saw that, it just blew my mind. And so this is, this is a, um, this is a nod to his work and that's how the idea of like solidified, just being like following the growth ring. There's a sapling in that too, I right. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. Um, speaking of growth rings, mm -hmm. as a little tangent, we can talk about how that like this piece, for example, is a, a flattened circle. Oh yeah, um, the, the process of making the forest into plywood is wild, it's <laughs> nuts. So this is, just real quick, if you notice, like this is the same branch, this is the same branch. Um, so after it's debarked, they'll make it so it's an even cylinder and then a crazy sharp uh, long blade will it'll spin it on its axis mm -hmm. and turn it into an eighth inch thick sheet. Mm -hmm. um, like shaving it? Yeah, it'll, it'll, sh it'll like shave the whole side instead of like shaving the end of the pencil, it's shaving the whole length, like eight feet long, into like one long sheet. Mm -hmm. And then like that goes through. Amazing like rolls to see. out the tree. It's amazing to see. It's just like, yeah. how can we do that? I have the, I have <laughs> if you've the, ever operated a saw, I think, holy shit. Yeah. I can't make this kind of a cut or do an eighth inch cut. Yeah, it's wild. It's huge. I have the I have the YouTube video. If anyone wants to see it. <laughs> I, know the, I know the one. Where you're just gonna slap your forehead. <laughs> like this is what we do with trees. Yeah. See you down there. We'll see you down there. How did this one come about? Please tell us that. <laughs> so that one, um, can I tag a question on yeah, that too? Yeah. The, the small one that came first mm -hmm. also didn't have holes in it, and I'm so curious if it was just a design thing or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so you probably noticed a small one, just to link those questions together. That was, uh, that was kind of a test piece. The original idea for a show, again, being like just eight foot two by fours, I was thinking of making a life-size sculpture of a person just using two by fours. Um, <clears throat> I realized that it was just like uncut eight foot two by fours, which would be even longer than that bottom piece, the longest piece. Um, it would, one, be so huge. Two, it would, in my 
sort of visualization of it, it would just be a little bit less interesting to just be straight. Um, so yeah, the, the front one is a test for the larger one that I had in mind. Um, I didn't intentionally, well, as I said, originally I was going to do just two by fours for the big sculpture. Um, and realized I had so much scrap lumber around that it m might be, might be interesting to utilize that. Most of this lumber is from remodeling this building and Christine and I's old house. So it's kind of like a, yeah, just bringing in uh, the actual labor of the trades and actual remodeling into a different setting. Um, the holes in it, uh, that came about really by way of design and then once I was thinking about it and, and wondering if that's what I really wanted to do, uh, realizing that the holes would in some ways tie into the parameter that I gave the sander. Um, there's something about, there's something about like getting through and just having the, uh, the kind of moon phases and the parameter that you can go, you can go until you're all the way through uh, with the sander pieces. So it seemed like it tied in, so I went for it. And it has the benefit of making it a bit lighter. <laughs> so many questions. Yeah. I read, I read your art, uh, the show statement for the first time tonight. Oh yeah, we're <laughs> saving it. Um, but there's a something about the line of like abstraction, uh, engaging sculpture as abstraction and perfection. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of duality in that state, like talking about what you're exploring. And I, feel, I feel like through reading the artist statement, this piece, like you have one side that's very concrete and very clear, and then the rest is made up. And just like it informed this piece more, which I've loved since I've seen it. But it's really nice, the gradient <laughs> of, of the concept of the piece. Fucking, it just has, it's really yeah. And you, you probably noticed that that is one of the, that's one of the pieces that I didn't write anything about. It just seemed, it seemed like there was a certain amount of accessibility and also possibility of interpretation on that one. Um, and I'm really glad that I didn't. I've heard really interesting ideas. Most of them involving motion and or time. Um, that the flat front being maybe in a more like Ram Das way, like be here now, that's like, that's the moment of existence. That's the moment of now. Um, and perhaps the everything behind could be uh, the content of life, whether it's, whether it's beauty or trauma or whatever, but we're just right here on this one sliver, razor edge of, of existing. So what I keep going back to reminds me of the first time I jumped out of an airplane. Mm -hmm. right, flat on the front, everything forced backwards. That's what I keep, this is like oh, yeah. parachuting, right? Yeah. Parachuting, but not, Parachuting gravitationally. But yeah. Parachuting. I've never done that. I imagine I imagine myself imagining the wind behind me too. Right. Just like whether it's visual or not, you're like cutting through the air and like all that. Yeah. Yeah. What reminds me of time traveling. Here and there you are. Yeah. But duh, I mean, did you glue all that together? I mean I just there's about a what gallon. Did you do? There's about a gallon with glue. I, I forgot the number, but I think it's like 400 deck screws. So it's just layer by layer. How much does it weigh? Do you think? I don't think how. Kyle knows. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Was it built yeah, in like 18 inch sections? What, what you know? Know? No, I just like, built it from the bottom up. You just oh, built it from the bottom yeah. up? Wow. So the, that cutout is actually the, the template. Right. And in my wonky basement floor shop, had to get that perfectly uh, perpendicular to the floor, and then um, we'll just go layer by layer. Like, basically lay out the layers and mark the edges of that and pile. And you can, can, can chisel it? 
And then, and then most of most of that, which I'm glad it's done. But, damn, it was terrible. Um, most of that's with an old axe. Yeah. There was an axe head that was found under our our barn when we cool. bought our house a few years ago, twelve years ago. Um, that's kind and of I, fun. And I just rehandled it. That was my first rehandling of a tool. Um, that's another tool that just wants to be in my hand. But it was pretty terrible. It was. Yeah. I think I lost track, but I think it was about 140 hours. And I also procrastinated starting that, so I finished that 3:30 in the morning, the, the night before the opening, oh my God. Um, and and woke Christine up several times. It was like a. You can you can see that I scored it with a circular saw, but then, you know, you, without some physicality, you can't actually get any of those rough edges, rough points. So it was mostly chopping with the axe on the sharp side and then bashing with the back side. <coughs> yeah, to the wow. point I had I like I my arms would die and I just so, like carpal so tunnel. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it was abuse. I think someone yeah. said labor is abuse. It was almost like my abusive yeah. friend that lived in the basement. It was like <laughs> it wasn't allowing me to see my friends. It was taking all my time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But there's that same hole in your heart. Labor, too, like, yeah. It's labor. And um, I also I love hear. how it's yeah. these small pieces, right, that become the structural integrity. Oh yeah, these cool. Scraps these tiny pieces and thinking about these as scraps of. Thomas projects yeah. and just kind of the scraps of labor and I don't know uh, I just love that like and I wonder if like and it, it, you know when you would say labor in times past you might think about a union and did you ever run into any unions in building trades or like have any thought about collectivism I guess like because if you think about the plywood is also this collective of trees right, that's been like fractured and then like put back together. I did, I did not want to unions. Just wondering. Yeah. But wait, say more. I, I don't think I fully understood. I, Where you <laughs> um, Maybe, like, I'm interested in the, the part about this piece that is the, um, the scraps of, of, like, shoring up of this place. And whether you think about these pieces in, um, in relation to community in any way. And if not, that's okay. <laughs> in relation to the community, I have not thought about that. Yeah. Because it's like, yeah. Or, the economy of anyone, labor is like what we're talking about. Or if anyone has heard me say something about that. <laughs> well, <laughs> when you like, do drugs by yourself and make us art? Yes. <laughs> I think when you, when you talk about that, it makes me think about the the two by fours leaning against the wall in relationship to this piece and these being things that were scraps that you were going to throw away that created this and those being pieces that are essentially worthless because you took out the, mm -hmm. the flaws mm -hmm. discarded makes it weaker the flaws found to be repurposed in a new form mm -hmm. make it valuable and that I don't know, kind of makes me think a little bit of what <clears throat> you're bringing up as far as community collectivism goes. I mean, I can riff on that a little bit, just kind of, um, I think that Thomas, as far as I know it, which started about 16 years ago, um, it's always been kind of a scrappy place. Uh, there's just like scrappy doers that are around and like collectively it has continued to improve itself and support us and sustain us and and uh, and keep us really cohesive. Yeah. So it's I guess it's our lives, but in thinking about that, it's uh, it's my life and and feeling uh, feeling like all these scrappy parts are coming together into into something. That's all I got. It's my, my <laughs> Good rap. Yeah. Is this 
plywood, or I don't know what kind of what it is, with all the little white, like that's made out of like scraps of wood that would be thrown away, right? Like that Which, kind of uh, the front one? The yeah, one? that one. So that is that is just reduction of a piece of plywood. Is plywood made out of scraps of wood, though? It's layers. It's made out of layers. Yeah, yeah it's like made out of. Uh, it's made out of trunks that were turned into like eighth inch, eight inch sheets. Like kind of shitty wood. Uh, sometimes. Like yeah, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> this is basically the cheapest. That's the cheap. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, you can get plywood that doesn't yeah. have any knots. You know, cabinet grade. Right, but this which, is like the cheapest plywood that is made from like the. Eh, yeah, yeah. We'll just sell it. It's got it's got branches. You know, it's like <laughs> it's gonna have some flaws. Yeah. But just by way of. Um, of laying the layers down perpendicular to each other. That's what makes it dimensionally stable. And because wood like uh, breathes and flexes and grows with the and temperature, it makes the wood kind of uh, both stable but also like fight itself. Yeah. So I remember growing up having a door in our house that reminds me of that middle strip where I would just stare at the knots yeah. because they had that kind of replication and they had this geometry and this psychedelic look and I just always loved staring at it. Yeah. But I'm curious, if, amongst all this, like, are there gems that you like came upon or images that you are you know, bonded to or I don't know? Um, bits and pieces where you're like, oh, that's it, I found it or something. You yeah. know, like there's this, like I love, I really love this piece probably the most because of all the texture. Like there's so much texture in there. Yeah. I'm curious, like I see your little checkerboard up the middle there and mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're creating things but you're also like, finding them. Yeah. So I'm curious what your, where your little gems are personally for you, if there are any. Gems in like, in scene or things? Yeah, like whatever, what, like, yeah, touching, yeah. like, I don't know. My first love space in there. Yeah, yeah. Or, or a memory that comes up or when you memory, see yeah. it. I don't know. But like for me, looking at that reminds me of being at my old house. And yeah. Staring at the door because it was just so sad. <laughs> <laughs> I guess one. <laughs> Six year old Corey. <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. Um, I'll tell you, that makes me think of. I just remember always seeing faces and everything. Mm -hmm. um, by way of the show, I have encountered so many people that have come in and uh, mostly, I was going to say enjoyed it, I don't know for sure, have uh, at least seen this. And a lot of the conversations have been um, kind of surrounding seeing what's in the wood grain. Mm -hmm. Some minds will see faces in the carpet and shapes in the clouds, and some won't. Um, so I guess, I don't know if I have a specific gem, but just the, I, I feel a little fortunate because I really enjoy seeing faces and everything. <laughs> One anecdote that I'm sure some of you have seen uh, that came about by way of this show, uh, I was on a framing crew for a while when I was in Portland, Oregon, and I was often distracted by wood grain and uh, and knots and etc. I remember one specific anecdote where we were, you know, just had our air tools and we were framing a house, which is an amazing experience if you've ever been around it because you get the bones of a house in like a day or two, right? It's like all of a sudden void turns into structure. It feels like you're almost done, but you barely yeah. got it done. Um, <laughs> but I just remember we're like banging this house together and I remember being like, do you guys see the, the goblin face in this board? <laughs> and uh, this dude, I think it's Mark. Is this an NPR crew? Yeah, yeah, it was okay, like, good. Yeah, but we also had to get shit done, dude. Um, and he was like, dude, just nail it in, you know? <laughs> His name was Big Mark. He was real funny. Big uh, Mark. Anyone else have ideas? Oh, I'll answer the question. Yeah. I had the same question. And I, also, I suspect that it is probably more to tackle than what we could really do in the next, you know, six to ten hours. So, well, we're open until midnight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my more pressing question yeah. 
Well, you have against classic rock, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Because over time, it's going to it's going to change, right? Yeah. And it's not going to change like a, a, a piece of wood because this is man-made, right? Mm -hmm. And it's going to come apart and change over time. And that's what's so cool about it. One yeah. of the things that I really like about it, it'll be different to me yeah. ten years from now than it is today because it of the way the way some of that wood may come yeah. apart. I would I would guess that that will mostly stay together. Um, the adhesives they use in plywood are pretty serious, pretty serious product. Um, but one thing that will certainly change is everything in here, by way of uh, being recently opened up. Uh, if you look, here's a great example. So if you look at these boards and just the beams that are supporting the second floor in this building, those were as light as these boards when we put them in five, years ago. five or six years ago. Um, and if you've ever opened up an old building, when you see those two by fours in there, they are dark, dark. So I don't know the chemical and or environmental process, um, but once wood is opened up, it will, it will slowly uh, change. It's like, I don't know, it's amazing. It just brings on richness and tone uh, that you can try to stop. I don't know why you would, but if it lasts long enough, you won't be able to stop it. It's also amazing. Like all of these, all of these pieces will be dark in color eventually. Yes. Yeah. yeah, like yeah, if there's any if there's any pictures or if any survive, you know, like holding yeah. it up. That's about that. Yeah, it's gonna make you wild. <laughs> We're not bringing up the climate wars or anything. <laughs> I mean, it's oxidation is what does it. It's, right. it's yeah. just yeah. general yeah. oxidation. We work with a, we're working with a bunch of old chestnut and every little hole from the chestnut weevil is dark around it. Because the oxygen got in mm -hmm. there and got around it, and nail the nail holes are they're another story. They get iron and shit in them, but see that's oxidation. Right. Once the air hits the wood. But interestingly, um, interestingly, there's someone trying to come in. Sunlight and UV will accelerate that. Oh, yeah, absolutely, deal. absolutely. Um, so there's some there's some things going on. Some of them understand. I know. I know, I know it's an engagement with oxygen. Oh, yeah, um, definitely. Um, but when you have exposed, exposed wood, it's yeah. definitely going to react to the UV light. Yeah, it's pretty fun. I just sanded a piece of wood on my. Yeah. Uh, so, on a spiritual level, I've seen a lot of your metal sculptures, and they're truly amazing. This is very organic. So, can you talk about. Um, if and how you've become one with these pieces, and how do you shed that relationship once this exhibit's over? It's like an actor shedding the character they've been playing or the characters. Spiritually, on this level, because this is so organic, unlike the metal sculptures, can you talk about your relationship with that spiritually and how? What's the next step for you? How do you shed this? How to shed? You're saying shed, right? How to shed this? Um, 
I guess I can say that working with organic materials is wildly different than uh, shaping metal, like finding and shaping metal. Uh, <coughs> if anyone has spent some time working wood, uh, for me anyway, it's, it's hard for me to forget the tree that it was. You can see that in several of the pieces in here. And there's no, there's no avoiding the connection of a life like laid bare in front of you um, while you, a living, a living being, is engaging that and, uh, and trying to find interest in it and in some ways in its, uh, in its carcass, the tree's carcass, right? Um, so yeah, that's a that is a moving experience. As far as shedding, I don't I don't know that I have much residue or like uh, need to need to continue connecting in that way. It's it seems more moment to moment for me personally. Um, so I guess the spiritualism for me was in the moment rather than. Uh, Continuing to bind. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you, John Ryan. Um, yeah. So I know that we were going to do this show in twenty twenty. Yeah, this was a. And we were starting to work on it uh, before we had to shut everything down. Mm -hmm. um, and I also know that you had a lot of ideas. And I wonder if you could like um, maybe tell us one or two that didn't get actualized or didn't make it into the show. Um, just out of curiosity, of other ways that your brain went in working with these materials, whether it will actually be a thing or not in the future. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the, what I'm going to do in the future. Just to answer that. I realize you kind of asked that too. Like what next? I don't know. I just started saying yesterday, I was like, I think I might want to mess around with stone. <laughs> so, um, so I don't even know. We'll see. Um, yeah, there was a couple pieces that I didn't finish or like concepts that weren't entirely fleshed out. Um, I thought there, I still think, there could be a show just reinterpreting um, just having like a material mashup show, like uh, like make a cinder block out of out of like a chunk of tree. Just make a perfect cinder block, the exact shape. Just just material mashup, you know, like uh, make a teapot out of solid marble. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Just anything. We become so used to the materials. Make a beer can out of, uh, I don't know, clear resin. Just to like, we, uh, I think that we collectively forget how much we interact physically with the world. And uh, I thought that there was maybe something of interest in that quick shock of an unexpected material showing up. In one of, in some of the most commonplace objects that we come across, um, that being a concept that is like that's its whole other arc, sure. For sure. Um, yeah, I can't, I'm trying to think of other things that are on the on the shop floor. Oh yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, what was that? <laughs> oh, it was like, it was like taking, I, I still have a bin that has one 8 foot 2 by 4 completely turned into sawdust and collected and, uh, and just finding a way to make that into a sphere, like a stud ball. <laughs> yeah. um, and then I was also going to make just there's a certain there's a certain uh, dimension that you can chop an eight foot two by four 
and get it into almost a perfect cube. So it would be stud cubes and stud balls and like, yeah. But somehow those didn't win. But I still might do those. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. Yeah, it is very interesting to watch you go through so many different ideas over the time. Yeah, there's a lot on the cutting floor, so to speak. On the shop floor, I guess it would be. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to let some things go. And also, I do want to just point out to everyone that is doing and making uh, a wild example of how we have to rely on each other. Like these, I was not, I didn't think that these were interesting. <laughs> um, I call it midwifing. Like we do, we do it for each other. But John Ryan was in, in my shop and I had one of these like not put together. And I was like, I don't know, that was like a test piece. It's not that cool. You know, and we started chatting about it, and the concepts showed up, and it was on the wall, and it turns out to be one of the probably main draws for people. Um, so yeah, just an example of like, we all have tons of blind spots, and we have to get back a little help from our friends. Mm -hmm. Some other story that's not around here. <laughs> but yeah, I couldn't find another one that I could actually take apart like that. Um, so it turned into this version. <laughs> kind of same concept, but not quite as funny or painful. That's so he's about definitely Yeah, yeah. We, we also discussed one night you eating that entire um, two by four. Yeah. The sawdust <laughs> just over the course of the month, like right, slowly right. dosing it in <laughs> breakfast. And, yeah, that was my sawdust. <laughs> but there was a video piece or something, it was just like yeah. video, two seconds of me swallowing. Uh, a <laughs> tablespoon of sawdust. Uh, I did. The, I ran the math on it, and I was like, I don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't remember the quantity I to eat per day, but it was too. Much. It was a lot. <laughs> there is another uh, one other piece that I think is interesting. It's by way of uh, there's an artist named Chris Combs who we're going to host this winter. Um, he's going to do some installations, mostly light based in here, but. He's a super interesting, just like fast brain, just conceptual, just super cool guy. We were talking about the show, and um, he was like, sweat. Sweat. I mean, it's about labor. It's about like these materials. Like, you got to do something to sweat. Like, I don't know. You know? And he was, <laughs> so for a second, um, I was, not for a second, I pondered that, and I just didn't do it. But even something of just like, collecting my own sweat and just like putting a piece of lumber in a jar and watching it like rot or whatever. You know, like how they want sweat equity or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, was that was a Chris Holmes idea that I think is pretty dope. I, mean, I didn't quite like, I didn't quite figure out the concept, you know. Sweat's too easy, but we need like the pus from the blister. Oh yes. <laughs> So something I really want to know from a sociological point of view, you were here a lot with your exhibit. Did people step on those gingerly, carefully, tripped on it, didn't notice it, kicked it around? What do you think most of the time, what did most people do? Avoid it. Most people fairly gingerly stepped on it. There's a lot of reading of you may walk upon out loud, and then they all stand around for a while and then Usually not all of them, but one person will go. Um, it's been awesome to see kids interact. Like, if I'm working, I'm like, you know, some people do snow angels in there, you know, and like all of a sudden it turns into a different thing. Um, the intent of this wasn't necessarily to walk on. I was just like fine with it by way of opening. We knew that some people would accidentally step on it. Uh, we did not anticipate how often that occurrence would be. Um, I was one of those. <laughs> yeah. And it's just it's just a terrible experience for people to think they just fucked up art. <laughs> yeah. So that's how that came about. That's not, but walking on it is not necessarily part of the concept. It's just part of the uh, engaging with it in a space. Yeah. That's kind. <laughs> And if you walk on it, you can do it barefoot. It gets a bit stabby sometimes, but you can probably make it make you stronger. <laughs> I'm feeling like we're probably wrapping up here pretty quick, huh? Thanks. Any more questions?
I have one more thing to say. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know more about this piece that came from. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So that's called collaboration. Um, that is a design from KJOY series. We have a couple of different names for the a couple of different titles of names. Anyway, there. Um, the original is up front there, just to get an idea of size and scale. And uh, as you all know, KJOY cases a lot of things. <laughs> so yeah, collaboration. Um, she was kind enough. Actually, we were both pretty stoked. Uh, and I was like, can I reinterpret that in large in plywood? And she was like, yeah. And so part of it being, being engaging someone else's design, and also just the practicality of time. And like, I don't have to design it and think about it and spend days delaboring this. Like, there's a dope design that I love, and I can just actualize it in different material. One of the concepts of that is why, why I decided to uh, actually remove some of the piece is in the, in the idea that it continues to be collaboration. Um, anyone who is around that, uh, whatever color wall they put it on, is going to reinterpret that piece. Um, I would be open to them putting their own colors, meanings, etc. in the voids. So, yeah, and that way it becomes like a three-part continuing collaboration. Yeah. Well, I'm also curious, if you saw the original piece, did you really kind of know, or did you like to talk about one that might be something you could explain on? That's a good question. Like, the, the idea showed up first, and then kind of flipping through the catalog, mm -hmm. that was the design that I was like, I must, mm -hmm. it must be this one. Which is not always the experience for me, but when it happens, it's it's so uh, you know, when there's just no when there's no chance that it's not the right one, all of a sudden it became that one wins and everything else is second place. You know, mm -hmm. tons of great designs, but yeah. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's mingle. It's time to like the restroom and.